this place is on fire. Across much of Europe, forest fires are intensifying year upon year. We want to know who started the fire and what we can do to avoid fanning the flames. More than 95% of uh, forest and wildfires caused by uh, citizens. So only 5% it's because of thunder or other uh, natural cause of fire. Or bears smoking in the wrong place. Except uh, Veresed has a, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, hopefully bears. no. <laughs> the numbers are not on our, on our side if we are speaking about uh, forest and wildfires. I, I absolutely agree because... How I am I going to put you guys in a fight? <laughs> we will. Okay, please. But, uh, because <laughs> I see I, who's going to win. Yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Standard Time, our talk show exploring a wide array of European matters and why Europe matters. I'm your host, Reka Kinga Pop, and each episode I'll be joined by flaming hot guests from all over Europe. We release new episodes every second Thursday, so don't miss out. Hit the subscribe button and set five to seven alarms so you never miss an episode. Also, don't forget to turn on the subtitles in one of the 15 wow. languages we publish. That's right, we've got you covered. It's an international show for an international audience, so comment below what your mother tongue is. Mine is Hungarian. It's not a very useful language, but I like it. Here, we have a map of Luxembourg. Cute, right? If we add up all the wildfires from the EU from 2023, it would cover Luxembourg twice, totaling above 500,000 hectares. When this show is published in autumn 2024, forest fire high season is still in full swing and trends are only going to get worse in the coming years. One key player that has to be mentioned whenever it comes to forest fires, well, that is climate change. Yeah! Yes, it does always come back to climate change. As global temperatures rise, they disrupt the Earth's water cycle. To put it very simply, wet areas are becoming wetter, but dry areas also become drier. With the increasing droughts, more forests die, and this leads to, well, ultimately, more fires. In 2023, European wildfires produced 20 megatons of CO2 emissions, as estimated by the European Forest Fire Information System, or EFI as they're called in the streets. This is nearly as much as a third of all emissions from international aviation in the EU in one year. This is a vicious circle. As climate change worsens droughts and heat waves, creating more opportunity for such blazes, the erupting fires themselves further fuel global warming. And speaking of fuel, the low humidity increases the risk of wildfires in places with a lot of litter. Both natural and human-made debris are a fire hazard. Scientists call this biomass or fuel availability. A According to the emissions expert Nikolaus Evangeliou, in several countries in Europe there are large boreal forests where no biomass removal or maintenance have ever been done. Evangeliou knows what he's talking about. His family home in Greece burned down twice, once in 1992 and another time in 1996. That's rough. So how did they stop this Greek tragedy? They started to clean the forests of dead wood and other dry biomass every single year and haven't seen such fires since. Of course this method works in smaller areas and to protect settlements, but is not really feasible on mountainous terrain or on thousands of hectares of natural forest. And not every wood is created equal. Some forests burn easier than others. Pines, for example, or Oh, eucalyptus trees tend to combust like a box of matches because they are so rich in resin and oils. Please, Portugal, stop planting eucalyptus trees. They don't belong there. Pines also tend to give a hard time to any smaller plants that would form an underbrush to protect the forest floor and keep moisture in there. Now, this leaves almost nothing on the ground but dead pine needles full of resin, which burst into flames like they're paid to do so. As a rule of thumb, native species and highly complex ecosystems tend to be way more resilient than, for instance, industrial forests. This is an important factor to consider for rewilding projects and tree planting as a measure to combat climate change. Local circumstances are key, and preventing disasters is always better than mitigating ones that are already happening, and we have just the people to tell us how to do it. Lieutenant Colonel Laszlo Bartovamos probably has the longest title of anybody who has ever been on this show so far. He is the head of the Department for Fire Protection at the National Inspectorate General for Fire Services, Deputy 
Deputy Director General for Operations, National Director General for Disaster Management in the Ministry of Interior in Hungary. So in short, he is in charge of both training, preparing and supporting firefighters who deal with forest fires. Maria Angela Paone is an Italian journalist working for El Diario in Spain. Her latest work includes a collaborative multimedia article about forest fires in Greece, Portugal and Spain. You can check it out in El Diario as well as on Display Europe. She is also the author of the book The Four Seasons of Athens. Gabor Gremsberger is the CEO and the founder of Climate Action LTD. He is a lawyer who completed his legal studies at Utrecht University in the Netherlands as well as at the University of Law in Pech, Hungary. He sees the future of climate protection in collecting and providing data which facilitates the continuous control of climate goals. <laughs> Hello and welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Let's start with you, Laszlo, because you work internationally on the fire protection of forests, including preparing international crews to deal with these. How do you land in fire protection? Because that's not your first uh, sort of trade and profession. And what's your motivation and who do you work with? Yes, thank you very much and thank you for the invitation to this talk show. So we had more than 15,000 forests and wildfires in Hungary in 2022. In this year, till now, we have uh, more than uh, 6,500 forests and wildfires. We, have, we expect that we reach almost 10 or 9,000 forest fires in Hungary. So the issue is uh, going to rise as well. So that's why we prepare to forest fires, especially our firefighters are trained. But uh, it's more important that citizens can do their best because we work together with uh, Forest Service in Hungary. And uh, according to their and our statistics, uh, the more than 95% of uh, forest and wildfires caused by uh, citizens. So only 5% it's because of thunder or other uh, natural cause of fire. Or bears smoking in the wrong place. Except uh, Veresed has a, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, smoking hopefully bears. no. <laughs> you know, if somebody in an excursion in, in uh, the hills and just ignite a fire so to uh, warm some food and uh, don't care about uh, the fire, it can spread uh, to the vegetation and, and uh, cause Real, really big fires. Uh, like in 2012, it was a 1,000 hectare fire in Bacskiskun country in the middle of uh, Hungary. It lasted approximately five days to put out the fire. Uh, about international experiences, uh, I checked the European Forest Fire Information System, and uh, according to the data, there were 1,200, and the burnt area was around 200,000 hectares. The numbers are not on our, on our side if we are speaking about uh, forest and wildfires. The European Union uh, make a lot of things to prepare for wildfires, especially to prepare the citizens, prepare the economic operators. But in the Union, there are a 24-hour service called Emergency Response Coordination Center, who coordinates the response to wildfires all over Europe. So if there's a huge fire, especially in Greece or, or Spain or Portugal, the member state can request for assistance. And through the European Union, the member and participating states can offer, for example, aerial forest firefighting units, ground forest firefighting units, and the union contact the uh, two countries and the help uh, can be there within 24 hours if uh, there are airplanes. And this is, the, I think, the basic of European solidarity. I've long been saying that people should just avoid the outdoors and stay in libraries. It might be good for us humans to be in the outdoors, but it's not good for the outdoors. And you've just proven my point. Maria Angela, you uh, have published this fantastic multimedia report recently, and you've reported primarily from Greece on site, um, but you also map the scope of, of the wildfires problem in Europe. Can you tell us about what level of involvement we have to imagine and how you end up reporting from Greece and what you've seen there. Uh, the 57 percent of large fire between uh, uh, 2000 and 2023 was in Greece, Portugal and Spain. Uh, what we have seen in our uh, uh, trip to these three countries is that uh, we have uh, so much lessons to learn 
from the experience of the last years. Uh, I was in Evia. Uh, it was the second uh, uh, wildfire, uh, the, the biggest, the second biggest one. Uh, the situation there uh, was uh, uh, very difficult because, uh, as uh, the citizens said, one of the problems was uh, the involvement of the local communities. In Greece, one of the big problems was that a change in, uh, that happened in the late 90s uh, when uh, the responsibility for the uh, prevention of the fire passed from the uh, forestry uh, service to the uh, firemen. 20 uh, years after this change, the situation uh, is not improved uh, because uh, still now the firemen are not prepared to act in the in the wild zone as Evia or Ebros. And that's one of the problems they already have. Another one was uh, the lesson that could be learned from Portugal. Uh, after the big fires of uh, 2017, 116 people died. Portugal changed its, uh, its strategy. They started to spend more and more money in prevention um, than in extinction. That is also one of the big problems. In Greece, for example, until now, even if there, there has been some changes, the 80% of the money is uh, still uh, uh, devoted to the uh, extinction, not prevention. And uh, another one is how we act after the, the wildfire. Uh, in Spain, 2022, uh, 22, yes, uh, we had this big, big fire in um, in the forestry of Zamora. The, the reforestation they did before with pines didn't make the situation easy with this new uh, fire. I'm sorry, I'm not an expert, but even I know that pines are not the ideal material if you want to avoid forest fires. But let's go to someone who actually works on the ecological side and uh, in a forest uh, sort of restoration project. Please tell us about how we can imagine, because Maria Angela has mentioned the prevention side of this problem. You guys work all over in Hungary, but yeah. uh, but yes, I, I absolutely agree because... How I... am I going to put you guys in a fight? <laughs> we will. Okay, please. But, uh, because <laughs> I see I, who's going to win. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think uh, in, in uh, forest fires, two very important things. One is uh, we have to think before. We have to educate the local uh, people what they can do and how they can do, how they can make fire, how they can make food in a forest, so how they can use forest in a good way. Uh, and, uh, and the second thing, if in a forest there is a fire, we have to realize as soon as possible. Because if we realize, then we can act fast and then, then we, can, we can stop. In, in, on time. How do we imagine this forestry project? So Our forestry projects is, uh, they, they are uh, forestry offsetting projects. So what we are doing, we are we separating uh, forest parts. So it's one, two, three, five hectares. And uh, we just scan which kind of trees are there. Does that mean that you guys start cutting down old trees and bringing in new or how how yeah, do like i imagine this, like that we, we make holes i mean we take the, the old trees it holes and we replanted the trees okay. that means we we develop the biodiversity of these uh, forest trees you guys also seem to work below the foliage level so you work on underbrush as well absolutely yes what does that mean why why do we need an underbrush isn't that just more fuel uh yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's it's uh, because we have to refresh the, mm -hmm. the 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 flowers also and and the, and the, and the, the the trees below also because the the fire is coming from there. Okay, Laszlo, defend your honor. Maria Angela has just said that the firemen are not the best suited to protect wild, from wildfires. They are more prepared for urgent urban fires. I understand you're talking about the Greek. Uh, level of preparation, Maria Angela. But let me edge this a little bit. Um, so when you think about prevention and preparation beforehand, what are the things that you concentrate on? How do you prepare for wildfires or how do you prevent them? I uh, agree on that way with uh, Maria Angela that uh, prevention is more important than uh, preparing for extinguishing. 
and uh, to invest more money in prevention. It depends by country who, the, who how the government decides, who is responsible for fire prevention. Uh, because yes, it's a good point to stay in libraries and don't go outside, but uh, people like to go outside because fresh air, you know, <laughs> in the wild, sometimes alone, not so many people over there. You can read in a forest as well. <laughs> so I think to prevention is a, is a common, common goal for local authorities, citizens, firefighters, especially firefighters have to prepare for the different kind of extinguishing fires because sometimes they need to have it burn and only make fire breaks and fire dams to prevent the spread of fire. Uh, you know, after two years in uh, in Evia, Evia is a precious uh, precious island. It's the second island of Greece, and it's very similar uh, landscape uh, to other places I know, my my own land, Calabria, or other parts of uh, Spain. And also, the feelings of the people are very similar. There, uh, they will still, uh, let's say, feeling uh, rage. We can we can say. Because uh, um, they saw at the time the first goal of the government was to evacuate people. Uh, why? Because uh, uh, at the time the the, um, the government of the of New Democracy uh, didn't want to repeat what happened in 2018 in uh, Madi in, in in Attica, where a lot of people died. So the main goal was not to repeat this experience, but. Uh, from the point of view of the local community, it was wrong to ask to all the people uh, to evacuate from the villages because they know how uh, the land was, how the territory was. So, uh, for example, in uh, uh, Gubies, uh, one of the villages more affected, uh, a group of people decided not to leave and to stay there fighting the fire along with the the firemen and the and the forestry services and in fact there they uh, um, saved a lot of houses that's why since then they ask for uh, to be more involved to take in, to take into account the knowledge uh, that the local people have of their own uh, their own uh, villages and I guess the terrain altogether, right? Because it's you have to have some kind of a, a local knowledge of the terrain to understand where the ditches are, where the... If you like what you see, and if you manage to make you laugh at least once, please support our work and go to patreon.com slash Eurozine. This is the magazine presenting this show. You can pledge as little as 5 euros a month, or whatever you can afford, and you'll get access to bonus materials, early access, and even get to suggest topics and questions. But now, back to the program. It is really important to handle all fires in a different way because which work in one fire, it's uh, not poss possible not working in another forest fire. So it depends on the local authority together with the firemen and, and forestry service how to protect a village especially. Because in some cases it's very easy to just cut a line, a clean line, and the forest fire can't reach the city. But in areas which is, uh, there's a description for a wide and urban interface when people build their house in the forest. And this is the border of the forest and the urban interface. And this, in these cases, it's really hard to protect these houses which under the trees. I wanted to ask you both about the use of new technologies. Ultimately, Gabor, what you guys are doing is that you are uh, quantifying something uh, that naturally occurs, but also something that as a traditional technology has been done for hundreds upon hundreds of years in forestry, yeah. like the observation of old trees, no new growth, how to sort of position them. It's important in this way because we are collecting a lot of data from forestries. And I think if we can analyze these kind of data, maybe we can, we can have some, some, uh, some results how we can realize before the fire. And how do you incorporate, or can you even find a channel to incorporate existing sort of traditional knowledge 
using these new technologies or Absolutely. is that just like you know putting this aside as superstition that no, yeah. somebody else will write a history book about yeah i i think we have to because forest tree forests are is is a, it's a long-term thinking so if you have to think in a long term with forest trees because if you if you reforest after 10 20 30 years you will have the results you have to use the traditional thinking in this ways and and also you have to you have to mix with the innovation new technologies i think that's the key i think there's also like a big difference between traditional knowledge of nature um, and uh, natural resources and what we would today in an agricultural sense term conventional knowledge which is industrial agriculture which has a tradition of let's let's put it very sort of generously at 80 years or so uh, which is completely different to what had happened before yeah. with the big machinery fertilizers massive scale uh, yields etc it did affect forestry i think much earlier than than other fields because timber has always been this incredibly important resource um, but i wonder whether um, in your work, class law, um, the incorporation of new technology brings in some kind of new help. I know that you guys are experimenting with drones, for instance, but yes. it's not like you send a drone and it springs a little water and then it's over. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yes, uh, in the United Arab Emirates, I see that they are researching drones which can hold uh, hoses and bring uh, water up to the... Really? Yeah, they are... I thought uh, that was researches. like a sci-fi dream. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. Uh, but in Hungary, we use the drones uh, for recognition sense. So uh, people go with a uh, SUV near to the fire, fly the drone and uh, bring uh, important information to the incident commander, what they also di did in North Macedonia. Uh, they directly send the data and the videos from the drone to the Macedonian command center. So you have like an aerial view of what's going on. You don't have to guess by the... Yeah, and uh, the drones have infrared cameras, so uh, we can spot the hot uh, spots uh, where the fires are. Uh, because, you know, in, in a forest fire there are huge sm smoke and yeah. it's almost impossible to see what's happening uh, behind the smoke and with uh, thermal cameras. To see the big, big scope because otherwise you cannot, you, you don't know where is the... Yes, yes, of the yes, fire, yes, yeah. exactly. But uh, to drones, it's uh, really hard to use them in prevention. We need to find out uh, how it's possible because we know that uh, there are satellite systems uh, using by the European Union and can monitor uh, the kind of uh, the type of vegetation as well and provide some support and financial support to forest uh, manager and land managers but it's more the topic of the forestry service and the agriculture uh, service. Uh, but back to your question about drones. Uh, it's useful for... I don't insist on drones. All I know about <laughs> them is that they upset bees. And you know, I, I think with drones, a very important thing is like a lot of people thinking about drones like small drones, but these are big, huge drones like yeah, can can be because first the drones was uh, the unmanned air, air vehicles was used by the army, yeah. the, and we use uh, drones which can uh, carried by an SUV. Can I ask to the, to our expert uh, if um, there there are programs of prevention uh, that already mm, take into account how the climate change is also changing the nature of wildfire i mean in uh, in our uh, uh, reports we we have seen also speaking with environmental specialists that one of the problem is that the weather conditions are changing so uh, they make it difficult to to fight against this fi these big fires yeah, from this point of view, there are uh, studies, as I know, and it was uh, introduced to uh, some conferences and uh, lessons learned meeting that uh, to, for instance, refor during reforestation, take into account which kind of, which type of forest is planted, because uh, 
there are wood uh, which can resist more to fires and there are wood which are not for example pine tree trees are uh, it's easier to burn but other trees it's hard to burn so uh, the plantation of uh, different type of wood it's it can be a solution to prevent not uh, the ignition of fire but the spread of fire to the whole whole forest hardwood tends to burn much slower uh, harder to ignite, but that's also the much slower woods to grow. So that's going to be a, a much longer process to actually situate them. And I think our oak forests in, in Hungary, most of them are artificial anyway, so they're not really the sort of native woodlands that one imagines. This is very important what she said, because uh, the climate changing is, I think it's faster than we think. And uh, that's why forestry has to change as well. So. We, I know in Hungary we are looking for new uh, kind of forest from the Balkan area because these trees are more uh, more uh, active in this uh, climate. Mm -hmm. And uh, with this case, I, I think we really have to think about this as well. So you mean like the southern type of plants are creeping up northwards? Yes. I've been telling my parents ever since our peaches died that the only thing they can plant is figs and olive trees because that's <laughs> yeah, where we we're headed. Olive, we, we Although olive, olive trees, trees yeah. also burn very well, really so that might not that. be a good idea. <laughs> yeah, because this oil is, is really a good yeah, thing. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. Also, uh, not really on the uh, on the subalt climate yet. So I think mm -hmm. we, we still have a couple of years to go there on the on the yellow pampas of endless sand over there. And I think what you say about climate change is first of all, it's faster than we think. But also the local effect of, ch of climate change are so much more varied. So we talk about global warming as a general trend. We talk about one, two, whatever number of degrees Celsius. But on the local level, microclimates severely change very quickly. And especially in the center and east of Europe, so much uh, groundwater has been lost in the past couple of decades because of so many reasons, but it's it's in a large part about how this region has been dealing with floods in the past 200 years. And the general principle is that you sort of regulate rivers as much as you can and you try to get rid of the water. But then what it results in is that a lot of water doesn't replenish. So altogether, the terrain is drying up. Absolutely. And then there's additional drying with the heat and everything else. So tell us about the effects that you see and what your, your studies in, for instance, carbon capture tell you. Because carbon capture is like, seems like a separate issue, but it does have to do a lot with climate change itself and the climate change goals. If you have a field and you can have a decision, you, forest, you make forestries, and if you have more benefit, like carbon capture or that kind of things, then maybe your decision will be easy, easier. Then you can have a better choice. But do you suggest that we have to incentivize people to use their land for forestry instead of like wheat production or yes, something? Yes, because like this? you know, if you if you make forestries, then you have to think for twenty five years, twenty years. So, yeah. and if you make, for example, a cornfield then every year you have some benefit. So that's the most important Yeah, until it thinking. dries yes. up and, it <laughs> and dies <laughs> yes. by the end of June, quite like yes. it did this year. Yes. Like this year's crop yields, especially in corn, all across this region, is a quarter of what was projected at the beginning. And I mean, I, I can feel, and I think you are, you are agree, I can feel on my skin, last two weeks are extremely so hot. Yeah, it's also these very persistent heat waves. But when we're talking about feeling immense heat, of course I have to come to you and ask you about your, like, how is the personal experience as somebody working in the field? Because I've never been around a forest fire, don't intend to, but I guess it's not bad if we can somehow picture and imagine the experience itself that you guys go through and go to. Firefighting the protective gear, the, uh, with boots, with breathing apparatus and helmet. In forest fires, if they work near the fire line where the smoke can occur, they uh, have it all on, on them. So with breathing apparatus, Is with hoses, heavy? it's uh, approximately 25 kilos all together. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's as much as I've put on since childbirth. It was a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you are physically okay? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Every, yeah every but fire still, I guess the smoke kills you first anyway, so you yes. have to have the breathing. Yeah, the breathing apparat. If you would like to try it uh, as the we are, uh, used to go on, on events, uh, for example, in the city park, and we use smoke tents and citizens can prove uh, how heavy it is, how they can breathe in the breathing apparat. All the gear is quite heavy. And uh, what is really dangerous for firefighters is the heat exposure. And that's why uh, there are always reserve. So one firefighter near the fire line work till the breathing apparat last uh, and they shift each other and they go to have a rest have some rest and then go back to the uh, fire line. So this is how we can uh, somehow reserve our human capabilities to, for example, in a long lasting forest fire. I understand. It's sometimes a guest always too much for me. So I respect your work very much. And it just and I know it's a silly question, but you know, as children, we all wanted to be firefighters at some point. I think most of us. I don't know, but I never wanted to be a policeman because my uncle was one and, uh, and I didn't really like his jokes. Um, but I really wanted to be a firefighter. But then it sort of dissipates over time as we understand the actual risks. So, so when you start to work in this field, which is extremely high risk compared to most of the sort of everyday jobs. What do your parents say? Like, how does that affect, so how does that culturally work? Uh, how do people sort of absorb this risk and caution and anxiety? Yeah, you know, in uh, the firefighters uh, community, there are lots of people working if, as a firefighters, like parents and grandparents uh, were also firefighters. My uh, father was teaching in the disaster management training center. So there are some tradition in my family to become uh, a person who tried to help uh, people in need. And this is how it uh, came to me. In other ways, people maybe in past choose to be uh, became firefighter because it's uh, not just a job it's a profession i guess it's a calling well professionally you're a lawyer less heroic tales about that although i was told i should have been one maybe i would have decent salaries if i did become one i didn't it's want a... to be a policeman as well <laughs> <laughs> neither okay we're, we're on a united front there but i um i wanted to ask you about what the persuasive power of the kind of data that you collect right now is and what you expect. Because what I've seen in, like, let's say 15 years of reporting on environmental topics, more or less, uh, is that there is so much data that proves points and there is so much disregard oftentimes for the inevitable obvious data. I think uh, it's getting better. And uh, I think people realize data is is really more and more important. And when they have to make a decision, of course, they use this kind of analyzing, uh, analysis. So I think data is, is very important in this case as well. So, and, and for nature as well, and for environment as well. Who's gonna pay for journalism and who's gonna consume it? Come and explore this and more questions with us in Warsaw, Poland at the 32nd European Meeting of Culture Journals dedicated to the means and modes of sustaining journalism between October 11th and 13th. You'll hear the Australian political theorist John Keane, Croatian TV journalist and my favorite person Ivana Dragicevic, Turkish publisher Mustafa Unlu and more. Link is in the description. If you can make it in person, do not fret. We'll also be live streaming it, so stay tuned. This conference is part of the Come Together Creative Journalism Project funded by the EU Commission, the Zeitstiftung Ebelin und Gerd Bocerius, and the Federal Ministry for Arts, Culture, Civil Service and Sport of the Republic of Austria. And we do love a good republic, don't we? <laughs> Maria Angela, what do you see? Because you also looked into, um, into the political level of dealing with these disasters and the disaster relief as well. Yeah, uh, the problem uh, is the same uh, for other problems, Rebecca. I mean, uh, the, that the politicians uh, seem not to have a, a long-term vision. No? Uh, so uh, they are looking to the next election also in, in this in this issue unfortunately so w one of the things uh, i remember uh, very well uh, one of the things uh, of the director of uh, the national weather center uh, I'm, i don't remember exactly the uh, the name uh, uh, of greece said no we already know what probably will happen what we don't see is the uh, political will 
to uh, to be prepared for mm -hmm. for that. That is more or less the experience. Uh, the question is to have the political will to look uh, to look forward, to look to have a, a, a long term vision. Thank you. I have just one closing question, and it might be a silly one. In this relatively small country of Hungary, which doesn't have significant military power, doesn't have significant technological arsenal or wherever, special rescue teams are very strong for some reason, right? So special rescue seems to be a strong suit. Our teams, you were there in Turkey after the earthquake, you helped out in Macedonia, and so do your colleagues, of course. Uh, special rescue teams from Mishkots, etc., are like world renowned. Why? I mean, I'm very glad, but how come? Uh, it's a kind of motivation uh, from which come inside of the people. As you mentioned, that uh, special uh, units are important. Yes, I can uh, say that in in Hungary there are uh, more than. 600 voluntary fire brigade firefighting associations with around uh, 20,000 people who are the members of these uh, voluntary firefighting associations, which is a quite uh, huge uh, number. And we have uh, special rescue units, as, as you mentioned. One of the uh, is the urban search and rescue team of called Hunor, and we have the second one. It's uh, called it's a medium one. It's it's Husar. Uh, we have also have voluntary rescue organization at uh, county levels and also at uh, uh, local levels. I don't know really exactly the reason why people like to be the part of this because there are no uh, tax reduction for them. They need to ask their employer to uh, let them for a, a free day uh, out of work to be part of this organization and go to a mission, for example. Because in Turkey, not only the professional rescue team were, but there were six other uh, voluntary rescue teams. These are the people who do these like miracle searches, dragging people from under the yeah. rubble. Uh, finding survivors, so these are kind of these devastating events where it's a wonder that anybody still Yes, and these are the uh, people who, for example, in 2010 or 2013 uh, helped to strengthen the dams uh, during the floods in Hungary and uh, they are in, in, in uh, the second line because first line the professionals who have uh, two minutes to go to an uh, incident. Voluntary people have a little bit uh, more time but if there's a long-lasting incident, their uh, work is uh, really necessary uh, to support the professional units. So it's just like a, a tradition of volunteerism? Maybe people like, uh, you know, they work in an office, for example, but they would like to uh, do another thing in the kind of spare time, to, which can support uh, other citizens. And do something more meaningful than just recycling their trash, which is nice, <laughs> don't get me wrong, but it's, it, it doesn't give you the feeling of impact as much. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Maria Angela, you included. And um, I hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. want to know, have you ever experienced such a fire? Which solution do you personally fancy and what's your favorite type of tree? Let us know in the comments below and while you're already rummaging down there, give us a like and subscribe to our channel. This talk show is presented by Eurozine and if you haven't heard of it, you should check it out right now because this online magazine trades in a scarcity item and that's insight. Eurozine publishes thoughtful long-form articles from more than a hundred partner journals across dozens of European languages and you have access to it all for free. Display Europe is the force behind this project. It's a content sharing platform that offers you articles, podcasts and videos about European politics and culture in 15 different languages. And yes, they don't even abuse your user data. I know it's unbelievable. Go check it out at displayeurope.eu. This program is co-funded by the Creative Europe Program of the European Union and the European Cultural Foundation. Importantly, the views and opinions expressed here are those of the speakers and the authors only. They do not necessarily reflect those of the European Union or the European Education and Culture Executive Agency. Neither do the European Union nor the EACA can be held responsible for them. Now, we wouldn't mind them taking advice from us though.